And without further ado, I welcome everyone to the Urugu study. We're covering um, pages 447 to 478. We're covering a section, um, theories of Euro-Caucasian behavior, the question of cause. And this is a really, really important and interesting um, section because we're um, we're giving a glimpse into the the why. You know, throughout the book, we're learning how this European behavior manifests. Now we're understanding why. Like, why is this happening? Why are Europeans so strange and aggressive? So, getting started, let's do our little um, summarization of this section. Um, I'll start. And then I'll pass it to someone. So um, basically, what I got from this is that um, there are there is like um, various theories as to why um, white people behave the way they do, and then we're gonna touch into those um, later. But most of it stems from like it being like part of their um, pathology, part of um, their being, due to possibly the harsh conditions they had to suffer in um, the Arctic and um, in their harsh environments where nature was literal was the literal enemy due to the harsh coldness and lack of resources thus that manifested and their need to be um, racist in order to um, acquire the resources that um, majority people have people being non-white people who are classified as black brown yellow red and whatnot and whatnot so we get, we, we get a, like a, uh, a look into just the origin of racism basically and i'll pass it to you, uh, mr n um man this these examples a historical breakdown of european behavior and I, i'm so i because I read so much of this and one day I'm still confused as to why they're the way they are. I still kind of agree with, um, I think Dr. Francis McRossing has the uh, most logical uh, reason for why they are the way they are. But um, just reading this and sure I learned about what Europeans stand for and what, what they what they truly are. They are not entities that are interested in anything but domination that's it that's it like they are they exist to dominate and um torture violence aggressiveness that's like in their dna it's in their uh it's in their essence it's really uh honestly it's not even scary at this point i'm kind of like i'm just ready for um things to get closer to being replaced with justice um, uh, it's, it's just a lot of, it's just a lot of evidence of what needs to be done. So I'm just waiting for um, folks to, you know, get on board and start talking about what needs to be done so we can solve the problem. Uh, popcorn, Kwaku. Uh, my summary for the theories of Caucasian behavior. Uh, Basically, Dr. Ami, she really brings um, together some of the, you know, outstanding theories that have, uh, still, you know, that have come from Caucasian, non-whites or whites, and really compared them, seeing how, seeing how they uh, do again, how they address the issues of behavior in Euro-Caucasians, and really goes in depth to help us understand that essentially for me that, you know, they, all these theories are essentially talking about the same thing, but the different varying perspectives of how Europeans see themselves and how, you know, Africans see Europeans and how those, how they vary. Um, I guess that's it for me. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and pick Mize. Would you pop for mice? Mice, uh, 
Hi, I'm just listening in for this um, chapter. I'm not yet there. Oh, okay. Uh, I'll go ahead and pick a uh, Ash. Um, yeah, just echoing what everyone else said. Um, the section was basically about an analysis of the different theories as to why Euro-Caucasian behavior is what it is. And it's pretty comprehensive, goes through like different theories based on like nature and nurture and power um, and like psychosexual. So, I mean, I'm sure we're gonna go through all of them. So there's no need to like talk about each one. I'll pass it to Nana, yeah. From what I got from the um, section here on the theories as well, not to continue on with the echoing, but <laughs> just to reinforce those ideas here is that um, European, European behavior is seen more as like a pathological or um, they're driven to be like su support superior or like supremacy. And it also states in the books that is some sort of like neurotic behavior that is found in like how they, they behave and excuse me <laughs> sorry and um it also is how they view africans or the cultural other if you will that's what the states in the book is this is all just within their dna and um you know how one of the things too that kept standing out is as we went through all of these theories it basically says that to sum it all up they're wired that way they're wired to believe that they are lacking in all of these areas and they have like they can't like compete or not even compete they can't hmm, like stand on their own basically so that that image of themselves is what drives them to put everyone else in that position because it also says like the it's a reflection of how they treat others is a reflection on how they really believe in like how they really um, feel about themselves so I just wanted to make that statement as well. So as we go through it, um, I'm sure we'll again point out some moments that where this is present, but I can't find exactly what page that's on until we get there. But I thought that was really important to really say on the air is that um, how the European treats others is really how they feel about themselves. And it's like this pathological wiring or neurotic wiring that um, emphasizes this lack. And if we're going with, um, Dr. Francis Cass Wilson will say it's a lack of uh, melanin of why they're so hurt. So, <laughs> and I'm gonna pass it to Sarah. Um, oh, what pages did we start this week's section? Because I read this chapter. 446 to 478. Okay, cool. Don't wanna go back to- 473. But we started at 446. Okay. Um, yeah, I have different theories. I mean, everyone said it. Something I thought that was interesting that I'm hoping we can discuss was when Dr. Annie was talking about how like to view it as a system, uh, like right, white supremacy as just power is a, is a purely European way to think about it, um, which, I really like that distinction because I feel like that is how imperialism is taught and even like all different types of assault, um, which is not surprising because we're taught in like a white supremacist education system, right? But like to for the things just to be about power and then that's it, not like the psychological or like the silly part about it. So I think that like helped me because I think up until this point, I, I mean, I thought that was like with these other theories, I thought that the power piece was like still true, but I think she's like differentiating between that. I think that kind of like takes away some of the evil of what white supremacy is and of the Asili. Yeah, that's all. Okay, what's that everyone? All right, excellent. Um... I have another question for everyone, unless someone wants to have something they want to share right off the bat. But this question may get um, may allow you to draw from um, one of your passages. 
Um, but um, what theory interest did it interest you the most that um that we covered in this section? Like, was it uh, Richard King's theory? Was it um Caban's theory? Was it Dr. Prescott Wilson theories? Was it Colville's theory? Which theory um sparked the most interest to you? Anyone would like to answer that question? Um. I mean, it's hard to say because some of them we already knew, like we read Psychopathic Racial Personality and we already obviously read ISIS papers. But I feel like if I had not read the, like ISIS papers, that would have been probably the most interesting theory to me. I thought Michael Bradley's was very interesting and a little like, I don't know if I completely, I, I, I buy the sexual dimorphism. But I don't know if I fully buy the whole Neanderthal thing. And I liked how she showed how he consistently contradicted himself in that. I thought that um, the one with Richard King is really, really interesting. And I want to look into that one more because um, I like how much time she spent on it. And I thought that, I thought that one was just the most interesting because it had a lot of like aspects of like spirituality that the other ones didn't have. Um, I thought Covell's was just like, for me, like the dumbest and purposefully like confusing. I just didn't, it didn't like correlate to me. So, yeah. Um, I think Michael Bradley had some, some made some decent points on the, on why Europeans are what they are. Like the, 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 the sexual that, the dysmorphism, I have a hard time saying those types of words for some reason. Um, but I believe that uh, he is providing some type of truth because he is a white male. Perhaps he is, you know, not being as truthful as he should be. Um, but uh, I also, uh, I, I don't know, I think he was on something. I think he he was uh, telling some, some, some remnants of the truth. Uh, and honestly, it's, it may be hard to believe that uh, the whole Neanderthal thing and coming from the caves, but something happened to the um, the Neanderthals and something happened to the cavemen. You know, they must have evolved too, and um, that that behavior pattern of survival is still within them, I believe. Um. <laughs> A lot for me. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, for me, a lot of the. I would say um, the most interesting, all of them are very interesting, minus Kobo's, because it was just uh, very confusing and like lots of um, words. Most of them were like, I would, cons I would call lies or um, withholding the, the truth. But I really, really appreciated Michael Bradley's um, theory because um, the whole aspect of um, white people seeing um themselves as like each one is like a, a its own unique species is um white people seeing themselves as, as their own unique species individually is it makes sense to me like for a white person to to look at another white person and not even see like someone who belongs to their group but uh, another individual white person who could be some sort of threat to them i think that can relate and, and um, allow us to understand why white people without race and white supremacy were like maiming each other and slaughtering each other by the, by the millions and thousands. Um, I also like um, Richard um, Kings a lot because he's one of the few um, writers who uh, has the, the scholarly um, ability to um, just, to, just straight up and say white people don't have souls. Like, they don't have souls. Or if they do have a soul, it has been like largely retarded or mutated or, or made something to be a soul that thrives for chaos, destruction, deception, and vileness. So I really, really appreciate Richard King's um, theory. Also Dr. Professor Presbosi theory has a lot of validity to it. It makes sense that um, combining Michael Bradley's theory with how like um, they have um, small penises due to their uh, evolutional um, track or whatever. Combining that with Dr. Francis Chris Wilson genetic inadequacy, you can understand why they're always focusing on like whose penis 
is bigger? Or why do black males supposedly have larger penises? If you could understand how all these theories like really, really relate to each other, if you understand racism, how what it is and how it works. And um, if you understand white people as I be as I, as I feel I do and I'm um, beginning to understand them. But the question again is um what theory most interests you? Well, when I was serving the question, the theory that interest that most interests me is uh, Dr. Francis Cress Golsing's theory of genetic inadequacy and them projecting projecting their beliefs on upon themselves onto others. So they treat people how they feel about themselves, so very aggressive, very violent. I think that one is the most interesting because to me, um, Dr. Francis Crespo Singh was a, uh, a doctor who had like 40 plus years of uh, experience. And I just feel like um, it's so rooted in logic and um, human psychology that it's hard to, to not um, to honestly believe. You know, to me, it's like when I read it, I just immediately believe it. And that's the only theory that 100% uh, resonates with me as true. Like uh, Bobby Wright's psychopathic personality. Um, that, 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 that is a very, uh, that's an accurate one, but um, it's, it's not as in depth or um, um, fleshed out as um, Dr. Francis Cresswell's theory is, I believe. For me, uh, so I there she gave the theories of non white or African poets or African writers or psychologist theorists, and then the white this um, Koval's one for me. Uh, it, it was an instance of you know kind of telling on yourself, you know, he he admits that European culture is in an infant state, which I would agree with. <laughs> um, I don't, I he, you know, he brings his claims. Obviously, it's not the bet, the the one I agree with the most. I just agree with that with that um, statement. Um, I I kind of enjoyed Michael Bradley's uh, theory about about it because um, I see, a, you know, um, sex for at least psychosexual or sex sexual. Um, concepts for Europeans being, you know, one of the things that I see most evident, especially as to why they would go around raping and raping so many of the world's peoples. Um, I, as as most of us have, we've all, you know, read Welsing's theory, so I didn't really have to, you know, I already knew what she was talking about, though. And I've, I've already agreed with that theory a long time, the first time it was pre presented to me, so I didn't need any kind of more convincing. Um, she also brought up uh, Diop's, Diop's uh, theory. Sorry, I lost my pages. My computer shut off. Diop's theory about the nor uh, the northern cradle. Um, I never really um, really heard of that concept before. The northern cradle and then the southern cradle. I've only heard of the cradle of civilization. You know, being um, uh, in Africa. So that was uh, interesting to. An interesting perspective and an interesting concept. And Richard King, Richard King's uh, concept was uh, very eye-opening. Uh, it's something that I've heard of. You know, the and it's even mentioned in this book and in other books about melanin and the connection that we have because of our melanin to you know higher to the source to the higher power. Um, so him going in depth with that it really got me thinking. Um, Thinking about, you know, the, I guess just more in depth of the importance of having melanin and the connection that it gives us, which, you know, ultimately brings brings me back to Welsing's theory, you know, and that, la that lack of melanin. Um, but to answer the question, I would have to say King's theory. And then Michael Bradley's in the, in the close second. Uh, another question is, um, what theories have the most validity do- um... Wait, Swak, can I, 
ask uh, yeah, respond please. to the first question. Yeah, I've, yeah. I just have, or for everyone, just to make sure I'm not missing something. When she, she was doing the introduction, she also mentioned Du Bois, but then that wasn't covered at all in this section, right? Correct. But if Du Bois has a, a theory that you're familiar with, you know, like you can surely um, share that one. Okay. No, I haven't. It's been highly recommended to me. And so I was just, when we started the section, I was really, ex that was like what seemed most interesting just because I like heard about it so much, but um, hopefully maybe it's like in the chapters to come or maybe we can read about it sometime in the future. But no, I, I'm not super familiar, but I heard it's really good. So just a shout out to that. <laughs> I'm done. Um, one of the things too that I wanted to quickly mention when I read through the theory section, um, the only thing that really like stood out and caught my my eye was honestly Dr. Francis Pest Welsing. I don't know if it's because I have read her book and I kind of went in depth with that theory, but I think it's also the one that makes the most sense to me. I know Koval or Koval also mentioned like they both kind of mentioned like oh it's systematic, but even some parts in that I kind of was like could be you know could be but the only thing that makes sense for my brain is that they have to be entirely wired different and she gave it to me they're wired different due to their lack of melanin so I don't know if it was and then she also mentions in her theory is that she feels it's not just a lack of resources that drives this superior like mindset or the superior majestic um, characteristics I think it's more of just like oh, they're, they're lacking like of this melanin. So therefore, and then she also mentions too, she goes in depth here is like how melanin, I'm not sure if it was, please correct me if it wasn't Dr. Francis Quest Wilson's part in the book, but it talked about how um, melanin basically gives you like, I don't want to use the word I don't want to use the word intelligence, but like smartness, you know, like, you know what I mean? Like it gives you something like, like energy. And it also like gives you like this different brain power that you can't, like, if you don't have melanin, you can't like utilize like the right half of your brain. So like, I don't know if I'm just getting too into that part, but that is pretty much what just like caught my eye. And I was like, this makes sense. It's okay for me to be wired differently, you know, just yeah. it makes sense. I think that was Richard King who, who touches on that, uh, on mel melanin being a, an intelligence. Melanin is an intelligence. The fact that we have neuromelanin, which is why we are perceived to be more um, sensitive than um, white people because they their lack of neuromelanin, which is controls your, how you feel pain, which is why a white person could get slapped in the face, not feel anything, a black person could get hit anywhere and they'll pick up on it because the neuromelanin is telling the body, hey, you're in danger, you know? So melanin is an intelligence in itself. And uh, unfortunately, I suspect melanin to be um, a very, very important substance that the body needs to um, function in a non-psychopathic. <laughs> in a non-psychopathic um, behavior. So if you don't have melanin, perhaps you could be more um, um, likely to do things such as raping babies, feeding babies to alligators, hanging black children, putting black children on ships and selling them to um, to countries called Americas and um, for slavery, sex farms. If you don't have melanin, this is perhaps why all these things can manifest because you don't care about anything. You don't, you don't have uh, any um, spiritual, connection to, hey, this is wrong. I shouldn't be hurting, causing harm, mistreating people. But perhaps because the lack of melanin, you just don't care about, you know, any any of like anything besides um, your own survival. And I'm pretty sure this, this is, has like some validity to melanin being a huge factor and like why this planet is in the state that it's in because melanin is very is, is required and due to white people's um, mutation due to their circumstances, perhaps their um, melanin producing capabilities has been retarded. Therefore, um, they are in a really, really um, 
destructive state that causes them to destroy myself and people who look like me 24 seven in order to compensate for um, their lack of melanin and their um, will to remain, I don't know, racist, white supremacist. You brought up some great points. One of the things too that I, when you're talking about this, I was thinking of like this, um, I know like in Francis Quest Wilson, we, we learned about like, even early in this book, this unconscious and conscious, um, like unconscious and conscious things that happen to us. So thinking from like a European like standpoint, um, is would you say like this lack of melanin would be like this unconscious thing that happens between a European like when they're born? So then they, that's the reason why they grow up and think a certain way. Because I know some people who always use the phrase, especially if they're European or white, they say things like, um, um, maybe I'm not racist or, but deep down they are racist, like unconsciously they are because it's just like they're, I don't know if I'm making sense, but I'm trying to say basically like there's this, this unconscious knowing, like this unconscious thing that says, hey, I'm lacking melanin, so I act this way. But to grow up in a European body with this unconscious thing that's happening within them, it kind of like is this battle between like who they want to be, but they can't be, if that makes sense. So maybe they want to be like, hey, I'm not racist. Right, I, I can be nice. Let's just say that, just for words. I can be nice. But this un thing is saying like, but you're not wired to be nice. Exactly. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah, I would, <laughs> I would say that um, the, the system of white supremacy is so awesome and powerful that a white person is definitely conditioned to be a, a racist um, due to like their environment. But even when they try to step out of like, that I'm not a racist box and, and attempt to learn about how to so-called not be a racist. It's just something in there as silly that where they're really approached with like producing justice and they're really approached with their with the reality that they've been con conditioned and trained to see black people as nothing more than animalistic niggers. The problem, like that's when they they can't handle the anxiety, the anxious emotions that arise from like really having to to deal with being a, a racist monster as black people have been made monsters and monstrosities, it's hard for us to deal with that reality as well. I'm sure it's hard for white people to, to really, um, and like me hopping into the mind of a, of a white person, you know, yeah, racism is on, on planet Earth, so what? Like, what can I do as an individual white person do about it? You know, I, and I also want to uh, translate um, the whole, I don't see color. You know, white people say, I don't see color. I think that could be translated into um, I don't see um, color being the root of why white people behave the way they do, you know, even though color, color, race is the most important thing on this planet because of white people. And I want to read this part really short, but it's why this, this short section is why we're all here, while we're all trying to solve this problem. And it's, she says, um, I hope to show you that the power of which I write stems from a view of the universe that what takes- What page, Swan? Oh yeah, my bad, 445. I hope to show that the power of which I write stems from a view of the universe that takes the symbols of whiteness and blackness with a deadly seriousness, spreads them out to the whole of human activity and from that point onto the many huge skin of men, thereby reducing them to categories of race. So white people really got together and came up with this really simplistic way to run the world, which is, hey, mistreat everyone who's not white. And we're gonna get a lot of benefits, material benefits from it. And, and, and that's all it took for us to all end up here <laughs> talking about this problem weekly. Um, one, of the, one of the things that comes to mind, too, as we're having this discussion here is that the whole thing with affirmative action and the whole diversity thing, it keeps coming to mind because it's like we almost are like joking each other, you know, like we're just playing around with each other like, oh, I can never I can never really feel to include anyone else other than myself. But let's put something in place to pretend, you know, let's pretend that I really want black people here because I really don't like deep down, whether it's unconscious or conscious, I don't. 
but it's not even just black it's just non-white people in a space you know it's always having to like push and shove especially in the education system it's like we we say these things about diversity and inclusion but it's like you can never really fully as like understand it or or you know what I mean just because it's an unconscious behavior but my question to you all is like how can we move forward from that because we know it's unconscious but it's like like how we move forward like white people can't just be wake up one morning and be like oh I love black people they can fetishize yes but they can't just like deeply do it I mean, I think I think like, the last thing you you, you just said kind of answers the question for for myself. You just gotta just be honest um, in all conversations. Uh, basically, hey, how are you doing? Doing good as I can be doing, you know, under while I'm living in a system dominated by white people. You know, white supremacy is real. Um, but can, how can we solve the problem together? We gotta talk about it. Um, but yeah, I think about that as well. Like. For me, I just try to be as honest as possible. Like, you know, I, I it's hard for me to like trust anyone in my institution because everyone in my institution is uh, belongs to the, uh, you know, Caucasoid species. So, um, and like <clears throat> they 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 show us their films, and um, I just learned that uh, one of my uh, I, I don't want to call these people my my professors anymore. So one of the people who works here he um he made a movie famous movie that has philip seymour hoffman in it and um basically there's a part in the movie where this black guy is getting fired and um the, the guy is just so rude to him and he's like get the you're fired you piece of shit and um, i could just hear like the the racism Right, and then I go to class and the, the, the following morning and then I, I could just, it all makes sense how he talks. Because, um, let me just go a little bit more deeper. We're, he's talking about his favorite color. He says, blue's my favorite color. My eyes are blue, it's the norm. That's what he said in the class, you know. That's the norm. So these Europeans really do uh, see themselves as the only human beings on the planet Earth, and um, the whole cultural other thing is to be received 100%. Um, all non-white people, especially Black people, can be killed and replaced quite easily. Um, so just be honest, like, you know, as a uh, Black male for myself, I gotta, um, I'm, I always try to be uh, honest. Like, when I come back to America, I'm at to rent a car. So by me doing that, I have to be honest with myself. I could get put over and shot in the face by a pig, you know, the same day I get the car, the next day. Very, very possible outcome, of, like, you know, by supremacy. So it would be dumb for me to, like, not know the risk that I, that I, that I have, you know? And white supremacy is something we all experience, so why not talk about it? You know? It's insanity not to. Let me stop uh, rambling. Um, I think that's a really good question. I, I think about that a lot. Um, I don't really have an answer, but I would say that the closest thing I'm thinking about is that like, one, I don't think that you should even be talking about or thinking about white people in terms of wanting to change them or do anything with them. I think you should just try to like build some sort, if you even can, because I don't even know if that's true, but build some sort of like, you know, um, coalition solidarity with the non-white people of the world, because there's more of us anyway. And um, you have to do that with the prospects of like upending the system, because you can't even try to just have a separate system that coexists with white people that doesn't work. I'm like, I was listening to this lecture about this woman who talked about black banks and how you can't even, like black banks don't work, they don't make money. And the only way for a black bank to like make money is to have to integrate themselves into white banks. So you literally have to just like end all of the institutions that we have today and it has to be all non-white people working together to do that without any care if white people join or not. That's what I think. 
I have a follow up question, but I know others want to want to answer. But I'm just gonna just say I have a follow up question, but I'll hold to the end. Um, to answer the question, I think it goes back to you know not trying to kid ourselves um, with these you know affirmative action, and even now with the with the new president and all of his executive actions going to what he would call equity. We see it's like we continue to kid ourselves. It's it goes back to this problem. You know, on page 449, where it, where Weber implies that the difference is intellectual, uh, it never seems to have occurred to any European theorist that the problem was not association of white skin with greater intelligence. Rather, it was with equating European culture with intelligence. So you have affirmative things like affirmative action, where oh, if we just get more black people in the end to you know these higher education, uh, the the uh, the race problem will somehow end, and you know you have black people who who honestly believe that. You know you have black people who believe that if we somehow are able to acquire wealth, we are no longer subject to racism and white supremacy. But racism and white supremacy controls all of the money, and you know then you go on and you, you you can even go into interracial marriages, whereas we continue to kid ourselves by oh if we are able to marry into these white families, we should racism doesn't exist. So but black people, African people, non-white people all over the globe need to stop kidding themselves. Racism, you, we, we have done things like affirmative action. We have done things like uh, race, uh, it, you know, interracially married. Sorry, coming into union with these with these other groups, and racism is still here. It still exists. So what exactly? are we still searching for? What, uh, what other evidence do we need that is telling us that racism doesn't, racism has ended. You know, I, I hear a lot of talk, especially with the new president and his health, his equity, his equity initiatives. And for me, it's just a load of hot air because once again, what does, what does equity actually mean? Are we just trying to get more people into schools? Are we trying to get more black people into schools? Are we trying to get more black people working? Of course, black people need to work, but are they going to be, you know, relegated for their entire lives into, you know, into just workers? Are they are they going to own some of these companies? Are they going to be able to, you know, like Ash said, own some of these banks and be able to have some successful banks? I don't think so. As long as we continue to kid ourselves into thinking that we can you know run away from racism and that if we don't address the the white the the white behaviors that you know caucasians exhibit that that racism will never end yeah so that's why i also didn't like bradley's because he literally was saying like we should all just have sex with each other and that will end like racism I, that's why I was like, this is very interesting that this white man is saying this. Yeah, I, I saw that too. And because he, let me find the page. On page, um, sorry, what's your question? Wait, don't forget your question. You follow up. Uh, oh, he's on 462 is he said uh, on 462, perhaps the most unique aspect of Bradley's argument is his conclusion that European values and behavior towards other may be casually tied to your Euro European sexual sensual life. And on the page before on 461, where uh, he says, or where, where Dr. Nee says, yeah, after all this, Bradley says that Caucasoid aggression is not innate, not racial and not immutable. Instead, he concludes that Western civilization can avoid aggression through sexual sensual activity, as did ancient Egypt and Chinese civilization. Since for Bradley, patterns of European behavior towards others is caused by an inordinate degree of undisplaced, undisplaced aggression. Yeah, uh, so that is kind of confusing. You know, he I felt he did well explaining, you know, why uh, like sexuality or psychosexuality contributes to their racism but you know coming to the conclusion i you know it's very i don't know how he could come to that kind of conclusion 
especially like reading destruction of black civilization and it's like obviously that didn't work for chem it, it ended up very bad for them so i don't think that that is like the, the solution but if for a white man that theory makes a lot of sense if you want to go around you know having sex with a bunch of non-white people all the time and have yeah. and say and say it's activism or something yeah just uh i definitely don't um agree that uh non-white people especially black people should be in sexual uh entanglements with uh, white people um nor do i think that will lead to any type of constructive work um being done and eliminating racism white supremacy um but there, there, there's no but actually that uh that is what i wanted to say um i think uh yeah I, i'm reading this book pieces of the puzzle, I'm just going to say, say in short, to engage, for a non-white person to engage with a white person is basically rape, you know, uh, it, it, it is probably better for a non-white person to uh, be killed versus having sexual relations with a white person because of the psychological uh, effects. It literally leaves the not my person unable to comprehend the existence of racism white supremacy and um what's that i have a question then or actually ray had a question so or no no yeah so you can go ahead no go ahead ask your question because i so i wrote mine down so i remember okay because um, uh diop is married to a white woman so do you think that his do you think that that's why his theory is essentially based in the nature or the nurture because in, he has to have it that way because that's his wife like do you know what i'm saying like like it's it's a it's about how they were like where they came from and not anything within their deep-rooted psychology if that makes sense I think when, when, when um, black scholars are married to white people, it often uh, inhibits their work from being um, constructive and truthful. For example, uh, Frantz Fanon, he gets a lot of criticism for his books. He's also married to a uh, white uh, woman. And um, not only is he married to a white woman, she wrote a lot of Wretched of the Earth because he was dying during that time. So. That's, that's another uh, layer. Tragic. So yeah, I um, I do believe that's why his theory was lacking in um, concrete evidence. It was more of this regurgitation of you know, oh, it's, it's they're like this because they they were they were nurtured poorly. No, they're like this because it's in their DNA, you know, or it's become part of their DNA through thousands and thousands of years of doing the same thing and only refining how it's done yeah. yeah um thank you for you know clarifying that i didn't know that about diop um it's disappointing to say the least um <laughs> but it, when now when he gave his theory it starts to make a little bit more sense it starts to make more sense i guess i was confused about it before but, you know, kind of giving those two different uh, environments, it's like, you know, sure, Europeans have to deal with barren wastelands, and, you know, and ice, but then Africans also had to deal with, you know, deserts and barren wastelands themselves, you know, places that were also inhabitable as, as we learned in the starts of the Black civilization. So I, I think it's definitely <laughs> a cop out to, you know, try and just pay, place it solely on the environment. The environment so you know, no doubt does play a role in it. But to say, you know, that these people are, you know, acting the way they are because of their culture grew in such a such a desolate area of the world, you know, okay, so then why why not why don't Africans, you know, have that kind of, you know, intention and that kind of motivate motivation? They don't, you know, so you know, a cop out for me. <laughs> yeah, I feel like it's so it should be a mixture of both because there's people in Greenland. And like there's native Russians who are like, you know, those like people who are like 
Inuits and their darker skin, they have like egalitarian, people who live in Greenland, they have like egalitarian structures. They, they have societies where women and men have like, are not, women are not treated in the same way that white women are treated by white men. It's more egalitarian. So there has to be something about white people specifically, because there's people who deal with really cold weather too. Yeah, so I didn't think that that checked out. Um, and also for Diop, it also talks about how like, um, I know that <laughs> Dr. Anif put it here in the words, but it said like empowered themselves. Like they came from nothing. Literally, I think it said they came from about nothing and it empowered themselves to like um, through aggression to get through the things that they wanted or something. That's the part it talked about for Diop in their section, I believe. And it was just very interesting how it's like they how it was just like transformed like Diop really believes that they empower themselves through aggression like through aggressive behavior to do all of these things like um colonialism imperialism and it says like genocide and slavery but it says <laughs> by which they have appropriated the resources of others if they cease to have access to those resources they would be at the mercy of the majority but it's just like, but they came and stole it, you know? They, they literally came and stole like resources because apparently they had nothing. And that is a reason for their madness is basically what Diop was saying. Please correct me if I'm wrong, but that's what I got from it. And it's like, no, bro, it's not about the resources. <laughs> yeah. Not the lack of. Mm -hmm. I made an error in um, applying logic to Diop's theory. I just thought, okay, uh, the logic here is that they came out of um, this harsh environment, which m meant that they had to behave harshly and act harshly. But I don't know if he um, if, if, if he uses that same logic. So I may have made an error in applying that logic to myself because the credo <laughs> theory is only worth mentioning if that logic is applied. Because it, or if he's just saying that hey, they have to behave this way, do from coming out of a harsh, harsh environment and not saying that they're harsh environment has hard coded into them the need to um attack nature and in, in their psyche nature is black people and not white people i don't think that was expressed throughout his in, in his theory so therefore um, again the confusion of being with a white woman possibly um um preventing this theory from being more fleshed out and more um realistic I feel like that was kind of what he was saying. Maybe okay. I was re reading it wrong. I hope I hope he was saying that. Yeah, that makes sense. I hope yeah, he I wanted to um, touch back on what Ash was saying about the societies, because I, uh, I I was watching like nomadic cultures on YouTube, and one of them happened to be Siberian uh, people who live in Siberia, and um, I don't know why I never knew where Siberia was, but I know it's in like over near Russia somewhere. Uh, but these people, you know, they looked white um, and they're living in like, you know, those nomadic societies where, you know, the women, like Ash said, egalitarian. And I don't really, you know, I didn't know this, like they, they know, I'm sure they're well aware of like Western civilization because they have snowmobiles. So I don't see them going to like, going into Europe and trying to, you know, no, no real urge. I, I can't say whether or not it's assumption, but I don't see them going into you know, trying to assimilate to that kind of European lifestyle, you know, but they live, they are, they're living and I guess somewhat thriving in this desolate barren wasteland that, you know, that Diop's describing here, you know, as the Northern Cradle. So, I mean, even more, 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 you know, more, more evidence that, you know, this isn't the whole story. It may be, you know, the white woman. Yeah, and I don't remember, well, like the Siberian people too, they're usually, I would consider them, they're like Asian looking to me or like Eurasian looking. Yeah, but so like, they were they were white, but they had like, like, you know, the, the low, the um, facial features of Asian, but they looked very, they looked very white, like Russian to me. Like pale? Yeah, pale, I should say. Well, cause they're not getting sun. I guess, they, they, <laughs> they still looked very like, I, if if you told me that I was a Russian, I wouldn't have known the difference. Oh, well, um, I thought it was interesting too. I don't know if it's Michael Bradley or Diop who talks about eating meat 
and how that like contributed to their aggression. I thought that was pretty like uh, not, did it make sense? Cause the Maasai people, their, their whole diet is basically like meat and milk and blood. And they're not necessarily known for being like, ex like excessively violent people. So I also thought that that was very interesting. One thing, one thing I found that was interesting too was Diop's the two cradle theory because I actually went to go research it because I was like, what is a two cradle theory? Like, let me go in depth with this. And it talks about like these literally like two like to break the world up in like two societies. Like we have the southern and the northern, and then he even went further and it talked about like the matriarchy and the patriarchy, and it was just very interesting to like do it the divide as matriarchy and patriarchy from what my understanding is matriarchy being like a society ruled by women okay thank you <laughs> and then patriarchy is obviously the opposite the society ruled by men so it's very interesting how he they're using the two cradle theory in this to like justify things so it's like oh so in a patriarchy society ruled by men there's a lot of aggression so there's also nothing to like build on or do like manly things and they're going to go and be aggressive and do all of these things but if there's a society with like matriarchy of women it's like described in the article described differently how the society would have been driven so like to apply it here i was thinking like are you saying that um with the i'm gonna say i'm gonna do quotes and say like the um, family structure that Europeans have, like the men and women and men being made the head of the household, basically like those words, is that why like their society was driven by like this aggressive behavior? Um, I, uh, if, I, if, I, if I could understand that the question, it, it, it would imply that, you know, men are inherently aggressive. That's why that, you know, society has turned out the way that it has. And I, I would have to disagree with that. Um, I don't think men are inherently aggressive. I think that, you know, European society, for whatever reason, I mean, we know why, but European men, European patriarchy is inherently aggressive. Um, but I think that's, you know, comes to the, uh, down to the Asili and what, what that culture, what it needs, right? For, in order for the culture to have control, it needs, I guess, male aggression. Yeah, yeah I think, okay, go yeah, ahead. So that's, yeah, I just wanted to just clarify. That's what I'm saying. So that's what, I'm not saying that I'm saying it, like I'm thinking that men are aggressive, but I'm saying that's essentially what the two cradle theory is stating. Cause they, they broke it up to being matriarchy half, like whether that's gonna be Southern or Northern, whichever. And the other half is gonna be patriarchy. And then that's why I'm using that reference. And I brought that research into this because now it's starting to make sense. Because if you see on page 464, um, it goes a little bit about their survival and their circumstances. Okay, right here it says about the second or third sentence, this behavior mode evolved as a way of life. Diop goes so far as to associate the comparatively larger amount of meat in the Indo-European diet. And then in quotes, it says compared to that of the Southern cradle with their aggressive nature. So it's just like this consistency and then keep going. Diop's treatment of European patriarchal society, social structure is interesting. Devalued as functioning social beings, women, he says, became viewed with disdain. In fact, the dowries offered by the women's parents became blah, blah, what I tell you, I'm not gonna keep reading that. But sorry, it's just like, but it's just like, I'm trying to connect the, like what he's actually saying, because I agree with you, Kwaku, like that is, that's the reason why I don't believe this is me to be like something I believe in, because this is ultimately saying like, um, yes, Europeans are naturally aggressive, but they're referring it to patriarchy, which is from my understanding is like a men led society, which is saying that men are naturally like their aggressive nature is to be aggressive. You know what I'm saying? Ash, help me out. <laughs> um, I kind of don't get what you're saying. I'm sorry. Um, are you saying that he differentiates the patriarchal societies and matriarchal societies, yet it's based on the idea that patriarchal societies are inherently more aggressive and that since that's the basis of his theory, it's like, does it actually apply to like non-white people? Because 
patri like aggressive patriarchy is seen explicitly in like European behavior. Okay. Yes, um, <laughs> yeah, I I thought that was interesting. I don't get it because I don't understand separating things from patriarchal to matriarchal because then you're completely like cutting out large swaths of people. Also, like I don't like that he calls it northern and southern cradle because it completely like cancels out the like all of the indigenous people that lived in America who are not European, who live in the north, who are not, who don't live in patriarchal or matriarchal societies or more egalitarian societies. So I didn't really get that either. And I also don't think that one, yeah, I don't think men are inherently like more aggressive. And I also don't think the division of labor is, was that simplified where it's like the men hunt and the women gather because a lot of times people hunt like, like small game, like rabbits, et cetera, which is like things that women and children were doing. So like if hunting is considered like aggressive behavior, then you can see that in like m women and children too. So I don't really know if it's a product of like circumstances or like environment, if I'm making sense. Like it's not like people are hunting like elks every day, right? To sustain a hunter gatherer group, you're probably gonna be hunting small things most of the time. And like one big thing, maybe like once a month or once a week or something like logistically. Yeah, it's, it's interesting, you know, that whole idea that like within European society that the that the women were such, you know, uh, ba such baggage, such, you know, I don't know what the, what the word is, you know, those ankle weights that they that they have for like prisoners, you know, like the idea that that women were that that was their only role in European society seems, you know, kind of ridiculous almost, you know, it's like, I'm sure women had more to contribute, but for whatever reason, uh, for whatever reason, I think it goes further back into what Plato and like their whole their whole organized homosexuality uh, that you know that they had to they had the women there was no place for women, so they had to you know come up with some whatever reason they could to you know effectively get rid like take women out of out of society and take out their I guess their work. Um, when you, as far as the diet goes, um, I, it's hard for me to say if that really contributed, because I mean, I, I can understand that certain parts of Europe were very like, uh, there's not a lot of resource, like resources, like you said, and maybe it was harder for them to grow food. Um, so maybe they just had to hunt uh, aggressive animals all the time to eat them for whatever reason. I don't know. I'm sure women helped out, uh, but Maybe, maybe that's what he was trying to get at when he was saying that. I don't, but then again, like, I don't think an elk is really aggressive. You know, I think it's just running for its life. You know, it's not like they were hunting mammoths or anything. I don't mean to go off topic, but something I really, I wanted to talk about that I really, really liked was when she kind of deconstructs Koval's whole theory especially the whole idea about dirt and poop and like feces and stuff. I really, really like that because I feel like we all learn about Freud from a young age and we learn about the whole anal stage and we learn about how it causes this preoccup preoccupation with dirt. And I, I had never seen the perspective that she brought out that like poop is like a fertilizer, like it grows things. Like, you know what I mean? Not to say that like you should be playing in poop, but like these things aren't inherently like negative. It's a very European idea to like split th those things into like that being negative and positive and then project that onto all of society that's not even European. And I was wondering like what your thoughts on that were because I know as black people, we often see our skin color as like dirt and then like see that as a pejorative, but really like dirt is not a pejorative, right? Like literally all life comes from it. So, yeah. I think that just goes back to that unconscious, uh, like that unconscious behavior of this lack of melanin. Cause have you, have you ever seen a European playing dirt? What's the first thing they do? Spread it on themselves, like skin. And they, they spread it on their faces. And they're like, oh, look at me. You know, it's like they want to be like some sort of image. But I think it's that unconscious. And it's also full cold. 
but I think it's some unconscious behavior of like lacking of melanin, but it looks, they like the way it looks, right? They enjoy, they enjoy dark skin. So it's like, it goes back to like, maybe they're even like, I'm not going to say it like definitely, but just an idea or a thought, they could be fetishizing over it at a young age, fetishizing over dark, dark skin. You know, they start young thinking about this and they grow up and wanted to be either a predator or be some sort of, okay, not to get all weird, but like, you know, rapist, but just a thought. Um, I really appreciate this part from from 459, uh, where she says, both Welsing and Coral recognize that white racism is a form of behavior that is systematic. This is important since it helps us to understand that Europeans have constructed a system of institutions which depend on and encourage a particular pattern of behavior towards peoples of color, i.e. a form of behavior that has been called racist. The style of behavior is therefore lodged comfortably within the matrix of the European culture, not a blight to be removed by cosmetic surgery. So this should give us a glimpse of um, what we're dealing with. We're not just dealing with a bunch of white people who have decided to be um, mean towards black people and non-white people. We're dealing with like something that is something that has embedded itself so deep in like the psyche of the white collective that we we shouldn't even expect them to help us solve this problem. If I'm being like brutally honest, the people who have solved this problem or who have to be the, the total shift in getting this problem solved are black people and non-white people because the white matrix, the white facility is unchangeable. We cannot change it. And um, that's a really important part that I remember um, Nana asked a question earlier about like white people and um, if they can help some some capacity like that. And um, I yeah. mm-hmm. I'm glad you um, glad you brought that up. Oh five. Now we're gonna circle back to my my next my follow up question. But Ash, hold those thoughts on Kovo because I do want to continue to conversate about that because I have some things highlighted there. Um, One of the things that as we're thinking about interacting with Europeans on a daily basis, I know I do within um, the education system that I participate in at the moment, is in a place of work, and I say this with the idea of um, some some non-white people having to go work in white institutions, it's like, how do we like work there without feeling this like mad, you know, like either, either mad, upset, or like, I don't want to just sit here and pretend all day, you know, but it's like, how do we like coexist, if you will, in like a same environment together? And I know we have previous discussions, but just to bring it up now is like, how can we coexist in this environment knowing that white people have this unconscious behavior of aggression and lack of melanin, therefore they're going to treat us a certain way, whether they're pretending or not. The short answer to that is we absolutely cannot coexist in a society like that. Um, The society that we know as it is today is not built nor set up to ever or has ever, you know, been set up to achieve this kind of this coexistence. Uh, In order for us to coexist, Yeah, justice would have to be, you know, be produced. But uh, I mean, justice has never been produced. So what does that society look like? Uh, I don't know. And what steps does it take? All I know is that we need to take steps to p- towards producing justice, and you know, which is balance between all people. I mean, that's that's my short answer. So. Well, I think I, I think I uh, wasn't clear on one part of my my um my. I think question. she means daily interactions. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that was. Mm. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt, but um, I know I get a lot of inspiration from obviously like Fuku sat by the door and like learning about like people in South Africa during apartheid, Palestinian people right now. Um, there's people who have to do it all the time. And I feel like we just have to get better at, cause we are in a war, not to sound like corny, but like, I think you do have to really build like that warrior mindset and you just have to compartmentalize your mind. like. 
when you're around white people, you're getting as much information as you can whilst not divulging much information about yourself whilst like asking questions but also like you know keeping space and i think it's just about being really really strategic about okay i'm about to be in this meeting with these white people how am i going to compose myself what do i expect out of it what is the worst possible thing that can happen and how am i prepared to like handle that and i think that that's the only way that you can really navigate your day-to-day -day is yeah like i think so i don't know so do you so do you think um so in the in this in this position that non-white people are in and we are understanding the european as we're going through these theories in this book here is now we're we have to just like almost sit in a room and continue to understand them but is it even like reasonable to try to implement something like implement justice in this specific area knowing that we're in a room and outnumbered by white people every day? I think anything that you can do always has to be like subversive under the table and only with non-white people. That's what I personally think. Yeah, I would say um, the code, the uh, black people need a code and um, the constant awareness and reality, and understanding that this is white people have started a, way, a war against us so we need to uh, we need thought, we need speech, and we need action. For example, a white person says, um, "Howdy, you know, how, how are you doing? Um, you know, with a cheery expression to you, you know." Now, would a soldier say howdy to an enemy soldier who has a rifle aimed at them? You know, a soldier would not do that in a battlefield. So why um, would black people? should have it in their code to not be so-called friendly for white people, to not smile around white people because in war, death and destruction all around you, you know, why are you, why are you smiling, especially when the enemy who is causing all of this death and destruction is right in front of you. you know, so we need speech, thought, and action. And the thought is, hey, I'm at war. The action is uh, I'm going to interact, interact with these people like a prisoner of war should, you know, learn what I can but not pretend like I am friends with these people, not pretend like we can actually have a relationship outside of trashy, tacky, and terroristic, because as long as white supremacy is on the planet, that's how our relationship shall remain, tacky, trashy, and terroristic involving white people. And that's just not ever gonna change until justice is on the planet. And that's gonna happen with critical, the critical mass of black people really being serious about this struggle, really being serious about the war that white people have started. And yeah, that's that's my answer. And just to but I think you also have to, oh, sorry. I think you also have to like be, like it's on code to like be courteous to white people because you, you um, produce the least amount of suspicion. I'm not saying like try to be friends with them, but like if a white person says howdy to you, I would say hello. And like, because that is minimizes the most amount of conflict. Like I'm sure a white, a black, if a white woman said hi to you and a black man didn't say hi to you, something could happen where she could accuse you of rape or something just for being so irritated that you didn't say howdy back to her. So I don't know, I think it's more about like navigating it in a certain type of way to have the least amount of suspicion. Yeah, one of the things I was thinking about too is like, just part another question, sorry not to hog the space, but um, as we navigate through these white spaces, it's like, what if we want, so for example, if I am an educator in an institution and I become um, a teacher, of course it's a white supremacy like institution. So I would have to technically create my, my if I wanted to teach um, outside of the white supremacy system, I would have to create my institution or not institution, not that, my education center in a different country in some far away place where like white supremacy can't get to. But um, in a system here in the States where white supremacy often is very clear and exists, it's like, how do we in the spaces of our work produce justice in those specific areas? So like, say we want to create, like someone wants to create a program in their workplace. Is it even a great use of their time and energy to create this program in a workplace? with the 
um, underlying ability or goal to be pro to produce justice? Uh, personally, for me, um, I, I'm starting to find it as, you know, the answer to that is no. I don't think, I mean, no, because, you know, white supremacy will take it and pervert it and, you know, turn it into something that was never, it was never intended to be. Uh, but then on the other note, it's white supremacy has all the resources and, you know, I guess the kind of platform for you to be able to do something like that. You know, you, you can obviously do some of these things yourself, um, but it's, you know, I think it goes back to the code where you, you know, ask for what should be given or what, what you need, take what is given and then compensate for, you know, the rest. I do. I think like these are really good questions. I also think because we're reading the labor part of the code book this Wednesday, like I feel like we'll like probably by then we'll have better, I'll probably have better answers. So I don't want to like give any like thoughts that I, before I've like read something that would probably give me a good reference. Understood. Yes, thank you. Okay, just something to keep in your your head and I was thinking about this as I was reading Urugu though just because like I'm thinking of like well damn you know like Europeans are something else man like unconsciously consciously forward inner whatever you want to say they're just something else they're just like this thing that is just what is this you know so as I'm going through this theory especially Kobo where he's like um all this racist behavior is due to the achievement of power. So can I become a madman just because I want some power too? Like, I'm just, I'm confused. Yeah, and I love how she breaks down the whole idea about, like, Colville's whole theory. Oh, I forgot where it was. Um, let me see, sorry. Well, she basically breaks down how his whole theory is based on this idea that you have to look back into the primitive, like, and that as we evolve, we're somehow getting better because we're able to, um, I guess, rationalize or um, cover up our, like, primitive desires or something. And I liked how she broke that down and was, like, African-centered thought, like, looks to the past not to like watch the primitive but to learn from and to understand so i thought that that was like really interesting and i thought i just think like the whole i just feel like Koval's whole theory is just personally for me i i thought it was just really stupid and um overly confusing so as to confuse the people who are reading it purposefully yeah, I would have to agree. Um, I think it's stupid because it's, you know, uh, based on Freud's theory, which, you know, he says he's like a Freudian. I can't believe people go around calling themselves that, you know, it, but it, it's, I liked how she asked that question on 453, where it was like, where she says, what is defined as dirt or bad becomes the object of an of anger because of the separation. But what about cultures in which dirt is sacred earth and even feces is associated with fertility? Whom did Freud observe? And I think like that's a question that's probably not asked nearly as nearly enough. You know, we Freud went around studying Europeans, came to all these conclusions about Europeans. And then Europeans applied it to the whole world, you know, in a uni in the universal fashion that they do things. So I, I think that uh, that this theory for those for those reasons is invalid. It's stupid, stupid, silly, primitive, <laughs> and pitiful. <laughs> that, you know, but that's it. And that's you know because black people unfortunately have been subject to that. That's you know all the things that they are. Indeed, I want to read um, from 471 because I really, Richard King's theory has so much validity to it. Wait, wait, before we go to that one, because I feel like that one's really good and we should spend a lot of time with that one. Maybe we should just like go through any other thoughts before that one. Yeah, yeah. Any other thoughts before um before pages uh, four? Because I really like that one. Before pages um, 
four, seven, eight, four, seven. Uh, I, I want to respond to what Nana Yao has said about justice, like places of learning, and I think maybe the workforce too. To me, to me, it's possible to have some type of infrastructure in place, but uh, to me, like it's the, the amount of time and energy it will take for a person to talk about racism, white supremacy, um, to white people, you know, in the atmosphere it will create. Uh, so, uh, that's, that's not what I say. I thought, I thought um, what you brought up was really interesting. And it made me think uh, if I would be willing to like openly talk about white supremacy uh, amongst my cohort, knowing that it won't really produce justice, it would just be emotional labor and um, me educating these white people. Thank you, Mr. N. Yeah, this is something to think about for sure. Um, one of the things I was thinking about for, I keep calling him Covell. Um, I don't know if it's because this is my Covell, it's Covell. Okay, but anyways, one of the things when I think of Covell on page um, 454, it has this whole paragraph about racism. It talks about, um, all of this allows Covell to conclude that racist belief is based on fantasy. And that really just was like, well then, you know, so you just think this is all make believe and it continues to say racism is a specific historical situation in which some um, elemental aspects of human experience are turned toward the classification and oppression of people with different ethnic traits. He argues that race fantasies are only secondarily related to the racial realities that they are actually generated in the universal human setting of childhood and used by the culture to handle its historical problems. So basically you're trying to tell me that this whole idea of racism is a whole fantasy. It, it, it's like he's saying racism is, we're using racism as just kind of like a placeholder to blame all of our, all of the, like the things that have happened to us. But I mean, it's like, <laughs> that's like, that's because all, everything that we've experienced, like that shouldn't have happened was due to racism. <laughs> right. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I thought that was interesting because I'm like, does he know what racism is? Because I think he's in some parts of it defining like tribalism because he's talking about like when, yeah, what Nanaya was reading uh, actually generated in the universal human setting of childhood and used by the culture to handle its historical problems which I don't even know if that's real, but even if it is real, like race as a concept is a new concept. So how could it be like a universal thing that was happening in childhoods of people long, long times ago, unless he means tribalism and not racism. I also thought, um, oh, I forgot what I was gonna say. I mean, it, like I could see how someone could come to that conclusion because oftentimes people use different races as like a scapegoat they'll be like oh it's the immigrants that are taking people's jobs or it's like the black welfare mom and things like that but like that's not because of a, it's not like a fantasy that people are taking out their problems on it's an actual like system of racism white supremacy right so it, it produces like a circular thought because it's like a cause and effect thing so i, I didn't really and it's I, it's still hard for me to understand and just uh, this is my final thought with Covell is that it continues to say on page 455, just to read the last paragraph, a um, couple sentences, it says, Covell's conclusion with regard to the cause of Europe's strange behavior is certainly disappointing. Okay, it seems that on it seems that on the one hand, Europeans became racist because they happened to be white or almost and therefore to fit infantile symbolo um, symbolic, um, symbolic elaborations concerning the feces and good and bad body in the right way, a way that places them in a position to achieve power over the rest of the world, which was darker, which is bad body. So it almost, it almost say like, 
hey, we can't, we can't blame the European because they're white. So it's not a race problem. They just happen to be the only white people in a world full of non-white people. So therefore they felt under attack. That's what I got. Yeah, and also, okay, also when I read that part, that's, I wrote something like, that doesn't even make sense because if, if this Freudian theory about the anal is like universal to all people, wouldn't that imply that even before black people were around white people, they hated themselves because they already associated their skin with poop. But like, that's not true and that's never been shown. So that doesn't make any sense. Like, and it's like, yeah, I, th I just thought that was interesting. Like, it's not until white people were introduced that black people did not like their dark skin. And that doesn't have anything to do with feces or yeah, childhood. <laughs> Yeah, I think it also kind of tries to re reinforce that whole idea that racism has always existed and people have always, you know, uh, first of all, racism hasn't always existed because race hasn't always existed. So we're, like with Koval's explanation and calling it like a fantasy and, you know, he, it's like he's almost trying to absolve Europeans of any wrongdoing and saying, oh, this is just like the natural course of, of the, universe, the universe. This is how... Being, this is how the universe has always operated when in fact Europeans were created race therefore they created racism to practice because I, I, I it reminds me of a conversation I was having with someone and they you know they told me that racism has always existed people have always mistreated each other uh, based on race but you know I I told them that that's incorrect because I agree that people have always mistreated each other. People have always, you know, had conflicts. That's that's nothing different. But no, racism has never existed because race has never it hasn't always existed. Yeah, even even if it did exist, which I doubt it did, it wasn't at the the scale. It wasn't at this scale where it was in every form of media as far as rhetoric and ideology. So, uh, yeah, a lot of Europeans will use that excuse. They'll say, oh, it's not, this is natural. People always have conflict. I've had several Europeans say that to me, that um, this is how it's supposed to be. And then I, I would respond, you mean you're supposed to, you know, be superior to me? So that's how it's supposed to be. And then this is but yeah. You actually brought up a great point, uh, Mr. N. One of the things too that I get frequently is they they almost associate racism with the idea of conflict. And those are two different things. Me being in a dispute with Ash is different from me saying, I'm in a dispute with Ash because she's dark or she's black. And then pretend I'm, pretend I'm white. But like, she's black, you know? It doesn't make, there's racism there. But it's not racism if I just like have natural conflict with somebody. Which they always say like, oh, they in Africa, they weren't having any conflict. Look at my face. Yeah, um, I, that's, I like in uh, the code book when he talks about different types of, I don't know if it's like different types of power, but like how people have immediate power versus like institutional type power. So I thought that, that that reminds me of what you were saying. And I like, I don't know where it is in this section, but when she talks about how they've changed the word racism and turned it into race relations and how it turns into these like interpersonal conflicts instead of like systems of white supremacy. I thought that was like really interesting in terms of like the refinement of white supremacy. And it was adding on to like what you were saying, Nanaya, about like, turning ideas of racism into just like bullying or conf or like, you know, just conflict. A lot of people are really like confused and using like a child understanding to like talk about these things. Uh, just, just one last thing, Ash, do you mind? Um, I actually need that quote. Um, I'm doing a, a research article on it for a class. And I would love to insert that quote into my article because it's, it's actually surrounding interpersonal relations um, with non-white people. So I would love to have that. Thank you for bringing that up. That's awesome. Yeah, I'll try to find it. Oh, and then I wanted to read another part too that I really liked. Um, on page 458, she says, 
Rather than leading to the perfect morality, as Plato would have us believe, it leads to systematic racist behavior and the construction of institutions that yield power. In this sense, the most rational Europeans, the Harvard professors, become the most effective supporters of the superstructure that guarantees European minority power over non-European, the majority, i.e. white racism. What does this imply about an African Harvard professor? And I kind of wanted to pose that question to the group because I thought that that was such a good question, especially in terms of like how we raise our youth to aspire to be in these institutions and aspire to go to college. Um, yeah, so what did you guys think about that part? Um, what, what page is that on? It's on 458, the, like the second paragraph. It start, the paragraph starts with, it was Plato who postulated. Okay. Um, pose the question one more time for me, please. So basically she's saying that like, instead of, you know, Plato's postulations leading to like this perfect society, it just leads to like institutions that are producing or perpetuating white supremacy. So in this sense, like what the highest, most institution you could think of is like Harvard, right? It's where most of our knowledge and ideas come from. So if that institution produces the most rational European that perpetuates white supremacy, what does that imply about an African Harvard professor? Basically like, okay, Ray, or Nana is gonna answer. Yeah. Um... When I, when I read this part, what did I put? I put uh, sustainability. And when I was thinking of sustainability, I was thinking of ways of like, um, last night we had a meeting and we talked about like this natural high. And we also talked about this part of like being in a state of being where um, it, it goes be, it goes beyond just like, hey, I'm gonna teach you this for the sake of having knowledge because knowledge is gonna be your power. But it's like Africans in this university, it's like, hey, we already have the power, you know, I'm going to teach you how to open your third eye and be above the line, be above the, you know, be above the earth and like be your higher self. So I think it's, it's going to be more of like a spiritual driven place to, to become like something that is elevated, something that is um, kind of in tuned, you know, like in tune with the earth, instead of just using um, Europeans using these institutions to provide you and manipulate you in a way in order to justify, hey, the more knowledge you have of this, this will make you powerful under our system. And that's the reason why most non-white people are not in tune with their higher selves because we're so focused on this obtaining of what they want us to know than of the things we should be learning about ourselves in order to elevate ourselves beyond and become almost close to the all-knowing. Um, yeah, uh, for me, the uh, I feel that it goes back to kind of like in the beginning with Plato or, you know, where they kind of mentioned like by the time somebody has reached that kind of status, like they already think like Plato, like how Plato w would imagine that person would think, like how, they, how they're expected to be thinking. So an African professor getting to that level, you know, to that status tells me that he has either come to terms with you know, racism, white supremacy, and he has there is therefore trying to assimilate into it. He it doesn't tell me that he's for the most part trying to solve the problem. I don't believe that a Harvard professor can really uh, an African Harvard professor really can even think, you know, with a, I guess with that African perspective and still call himself a Harvard professor. Yeah, I agree. I think a Har an African Harvard professor is very useless to African-centered people and very useful for white supremacy. If, if anything, they're being showcased, just like case in point, uh, Cornell West, you know, they, they used and abused him. He thought he was going to get something out of that relationship. And they told you, they reminded him once again, hey, you're Black. How dare you think you, you can 
you can get something from us. You know, we, we only needed you to bring more black people and drive our credibility and, you know, put us out, put, make us seem important to black people. You know, we, you, you, you stupid fool. How, how could you think you're going to get something from this relationship? Yeah, when I, when I heard the question, I, I thought was, <laughs> I thought you meant like an entire school, like, if an African were to create this system, that's what I was thinking. But yes, in a system of white supremacy, everybody's European. Like you can't, you can't like go max a system of, of white supremacy. So that was my answer for that. Not, the other thing was if, if it ever was to exist. <laughs> no, yeah, I, I liked that answer. I understood what you were trying to say. I guess if nobody has any other comments, we can move on to Richard King. Cause that was pretty amazing. Do you want to yeah, go O five? I, I wanted to make one more one more point, just because like I I see you know I guess on more what I was saying I see this so much where you know these these African professors or African people make it to, to these places of status and then they feel the need to come and tell all of us about it and tell us to come and aspire to it, and you know it's just that. <laughs> They, they either they don't realize it and I realize it that they have given up on you know creating justice a system of justice they gave up on that a long time ago and rather they have aspired to you know keep the current system in place by telling us like oh you know just just get in there and do do your thing you know get in there and change the system you know you can't get there without you know giving into the system. You can't get there without being a part of the system. You can't get there without perpetuating the system. When will they understand that? You know, I think they, they know what they're doing. And I think they're trying to tell white people that they are the managers of black people. Yikes. True. We can, yeah. we can go on. Just the masterfulness of um, white supremacy to racially showcase um, various black people, non-white people, and, and various institutions uh, will always be one of their um, prime bread and butters, something they can always rely on, something that, that can always get the job done, because most black people um, don't know what they're looking at. Unfortunately, everything they're looking at is racist and white supremacy. So um, great, great, great um, example of bringing up Cornell West, uh, him um, fell in to get um, tenure. Prime example of racism and white supremacy. Wait, Cornel West doesn't, doesn't have tenure? <laughs> that is fucking hilarious. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Wow, I didn't, I, I'm sorry for cursing. That is just so crazy to me because Harvard uses him. Thank you for that information, O5. That's laughable. Yeah, uh, it's, it's, it just came out a couple days ago. He's like, he was up for tenure and they were, they basically told him that, you know, he requested and they denied him. So, and he's dealing with that now, you know, wow, you know, the, the oh, the coonism, you know, everything he did, <laughs> and, uh, case in point, case in point. Mm. So, um, are we ready to step into King's theory? Uh, I really, uh, I must begin with um, reading this part because um, white people love this this fictional universe called Star Wars, where the whole theme is lightness or whiteness versus darkness or the dark side. So um, since I've been studying the race problem, Star Wars ha has shown itself to be a huge aspect of um, this system. Or you just hear a clear example of like the length to which white people function in this white side versus the dark side. And, and, and there's, there, there's so many explanations as to why um, this is so. And um, this King's theory, King's theory being one of them. And on 471, he's, um, she says, King's theories explain why blackness came to represent evil and why the dark side became threatening to became threatening blackness indeed was the spiritual metaphysical realm to which europeans had little if any access 
the dark side of things was the inner vision of the unconscious that opened the door to communicate to communication with ancestral symbols and wisdom. His theory would also help to explain the patriarchal nature of European culture since for C.G. Jung, the matriarchal principle is the key to this primary spiritual consciousness. The matriarchal principle also represents the African womb. European fear of the knowledge of their own origins would in addition account for the reason they worked so hard to make it appear that everything of value began with them, a complete reversal of reality. Since they know that they and their culture are comparatively long, this accounts for the progress theory in which the true place of human origins, Africa, represent a universal state of ignorance, darkness. So this is very, very deep, especially when you um, post this with um, um, Kobe Kazimba, Caban's theory of how like white people, white supremacy is literally uh, reality in, inverted um place uh upside down because um the dark side melanin is simply just intelligence knowing that hey you're in this universe for a specific reason you know white people seem to believe that they're in this universe to acquire things material things and to um have fun acquiring and material things but this theory shows us that like um the first majority peoples of the world they were deeply connected with some with their assignment or something that white people cannot tap into for some probably because of their lack of melanin so therefore their lack of melanin they placed this they have created this reality where like it's literally white versus black and this entire world functions on white must destroy black so white can survive and i think on these theories um, are really great help for people who want to solve this problem and allowing us to understand this behavior much more than like hey this white person is being mean to me but why has this white person been mean to me for thousands of years and it's because oh they're silly and um they actually resent being um the children of um africans the 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 last people to come into um what we call society or civilization, they were the last to do so. And perhaps they, they feel some type of way about that, which is why they force us to be slaves and be their victims. Yeah, I wanted to talk, uh, mention the, um, well, thank you for that, O5. Uh, two things I wanted to talk about was the pineal gland and then the dark side. Uh, for me, uh, the pineal gland, I, uh, for some time now, I've noticed that it is a target for white people, uh, especially, you know, I've read that fluoride calcifies your pineal gland, therefore making you unable to, you know, access certain parts of your brain. That's one of the reasons why I don't use a fluoride, like toothpaste, and I don't drink um, tap water, uh, that and Flint. Um, and for you know, reading King's theory really gave me some some insight and a real understanding of how important the pineal gland is, and because uh, specifically for the purposes that it serves, you know, understanding that you know the white supremacist is, is is you know actively attempting to calcify and make our pineal glands inoperable makes complete sense in you know the fact that it produces melanin and allows us to you know reach that higher state of consciousness, therefore being able to talk to speak to our ancestors. Um, and, you know, as far as the dark side goes, I know that as a child, most children are afraid of the dark, you know, um, and, you know, thinking about it, you know, watching all the shows that you do, the cartoons, the media and the, the entertainment, you know, they, a lot of horrible, atrocious things happen in the dark, you know, therefore, you know, traumatizing us and, and ensuring that, you know, we don't, that everything, even even saying the word darkness, it still sounds, you know, somewhat like evil or improper. And, you know, that just goes to show like the the real effort and intentions that the white supremacists have, you know, carried out to ensure that we still don't seek that 
part of ourselves. You know, something so crucial, something so spiritual as dreaming, you know, that requires you to go into the dark for it to happen. Yet we are so scared. And I think most, uh, I can speak for myself. I, at one point in time, I was more traumatized with having a nightmare, thinking I would have more nightmares than, than you know, actual dreams about anything. So therefore I would not want to pursue, you know, you know, people talk about being able to control their dreams. People talk about doing things in their dreams. But for me, I still struggle with those things. And I, and I know it's due to the, the brainwashing and the conditioning of racism and white supremacy. So um, uh, that's it for me from now. Another thing that I, I think Black people should um, understand is that we are dealing with a um insane race of people actually the only race of people is the white nation is the white race so we are dealing with the only race this insane race of people who i think can be classified as functionally insane due to how they operate planet earth and um so we're dealing with um, an insane group of people who live in a fantasy and we have been made pawns and their fantasies to be the, the, the kings and queens and everything in between within their fantasy. So um, from this is coming from the Kolingi Kaban theory, um, which is like the del delusional construction of reality theory. And um, from page 472, it states um, there psychological defensiveness resulted, resulted in psychopathology, a fabricated reality in which the value of the European white self is exaggerated. Their creed says Caban becomes, I am perfect. In a reality that reverses reality, nature, blackness, Africanness, color is imperfect. Caban seems to be saying that the that Europeans have not only remained severely damaged psychologically, but all of their cultural behavior can be understood as a defense of this connection. When combining this page with the, the Francis Crest Wilson theory, you can clearly understand a European as a insane, fanatical monster, which can also explain the state of most black people being made into monsters and monstrosities by the king monster himself the white race. Is this making sense or am I just rambling over on here? Makes sense to me. Yeah, it makes sense to me. I'm wondering too, because I remember listening to Dr. Welsing's interviews and she always talked about how like her father wanted her to look into like melanin. So I'm wondering if she read Richard King's work because it seems like it, his books came out 1987 and 1990. So I, do you guys know, if, like, have you, did you hear of Richard King before this? Do you know if they have any connection? Because I feel like he kind of, in a way, like completed some of the work that she wanted to do too. I, I, would, I don't think they have had much contact with one another. Unfortunately, I would hope so, but, um. I think they would have mentioned one another and if that had been the case. But um, yeah, this is why it's up to um, us to um, gather the pieces to the puzzle, arrange it so we can get a clear understanding of what we're looking at. There's white people, you know, how they're running amok on planet Earth. Yeah, I've never heard of uh, Richard King prior to this. Um... Yeah, this is the first time. I have the ISIS papers here, and uh, I think the uh, chapter where she talks about uh, melanin, which is, w was in the Neurochemical Basis for Evil, chapter 19, and that essay came out in 1988. So maybe they did get together. I don't think she credited him with anything in this, but maybe they did get together to talk about it. Who knows? Um, also, oh, go ahead. 
Uh, you go. Oh, I was just going to say, like, um, kind of just like reading through the, I really liked reading the whole, like, scientific and, like, nutritional base when they, when she goes into, like, the melanocyte stimulating hormone, et cetera, that type of stuff. That was really, really interesting to me. And I was wondering, too, like, um, one, I was wondering, like, how do you think, like, we as people who, like, have more melanin? can take the steps to, you know, like increase our spiritual connection, our connection to our ancestors, our, our connection to like ancestral time. Like what are the steps that we can take today to kind of have those type of connections that our ancestors have? And I was also wondering like, what do you guys think about people who read this stuff who are like, not fully like who are like who have a lot of white ancestry who don't produce maybe a lot of melanin not to say like not to say that I want to center them but I was just wondering like what your thoughts would be if you like presented this information to them because I've heard people say like Dr. Welsing stuff is like pseudoscience and stuff like that so uh well to answer the first question I think that um for me, I would try to go back and find out about more spiritual practices because I don't know anything about spirit spirituality or I don't know enough. Um, I think I've been retarded in the sense that, you know, I'm unable to reach that, you know, actually tap into my melanin or notice when I am tapping into it, however you, however you want to call it. Um, I think that by learning some of those spiritual practices, going back to, you know, ancestral practices, that'll, you know, help me, you know, be able to tap into, it, tap into my melanin and get the full potential, use it to its full potential. Uh, uh, to answer the second question, it, it is very interesting just because I see a lot of, you know, like white, white people, Europeans, you know, essentially acting non-white and acting, I, you know, I, <laughs> It's interesting because I don't know if it's a whole facade or what. I don't know who who they're talking to, what they're seeking out, um, but they seem to feel that they are somewhat in tune with these, with uh, with melanin, I guess. Um, I yeah, I don't, I don't know, I don't know, what, I don't know what a white person would say pretty much i don't know i don't know what what to do i don't know what to do with the reaction if i brought them this information like hey uh people with melanin are the only people who can you know tap into the tap in tap into spirituality what you're doing here is kind of offensive yeah i mean not even like white people i mean yeah white people but also just like like people who let's say are so-called like classified non-white but like have a lot of white ancestry where it's like 60 plus percent of the ancestors like that was what I was wondering like what you think their thoughts would be on this I think, I think the they would the thoughts would be uh, either indication that they are racist suspect or they're that they are melanated and to some degree because those who have a um, an ability to absorb truth oftentimes are white people, from my experience, or are very confused um, victims of white, of white supremacy. But it's easy to clear to tell the difference. Oh, I was just going to say that um, they're just faking it. I think, honestly, if they ever tried, okay, no, let me, let me revert back. Okay, so my real answer is. <laughs> Um, someone who is possibly melanated or has some sort of melanin and they have a lot of European ancestry, ancestry, um, it's going to be very hard for them to tap into it, honestly. Like, it's just, from what I've understood and from what I've been learning about um, spirituality and um, how to like elevate yourself and how to even just open the blockages to even enter in spirituality. It, there has to be some form of um, like almost connection or belief 
connection if you know what i mean like you can't just wake up one morning and be like oh i feel my ancestors you possibly can you can but it's more of just like you're not going to be able to like tap into it if you're not really um like having a a clear connection because someone with i feel like with with uh, white ancestry has a lot of blockage therefore if you have a lot of blockage and not enough generational clearness between people who are practicing or people who are um, reaching for um, spiritual spirituality daily, such as someone who's like has lots of melanin, which may be a little bit easier for them, and has melanated ancestry from now all the way back, that may be a little bit easier for them than to I always want to say like the Africans here, African Americans here, where it's like they were raped, raped by Europeans and then. It's just like the European and the splits, but not to get too complicated. I think it's just, it will be a little bit difficult. <laughs> I just wanted to read what Mice put in the chat. Um, she put further reduction of calcification of the pineal glands by having melatonin enriching foods like tart cherry juice slash pineapple juice which is, this is the common, this is common in the elite European diet purchasable at Whole Foods in terms of ancestor connection, setting up an altar for daily prayers to the ancestors. And um, thank you for that. I appreciate that. Yeah, I, uh, <clears throat> if I don't know, I want to touch on and read is um, also comes from, um, from Richard King's uh, phenomenal um, work that Dr. Ani has um, included in her text for us. So um, um, I, I would highly suggest anyone who, who has watched this video this far to just um, either read the section of the book or to go listen to some Richard King lectures or um, get his books because this information is very, very um, important to solving this problem and understanding this problem, I believe. And uh, he says, uh, well, on page 470, she says, in King's view, this com this. Oh, let me fucking close my. Door. All right. So, um, in King's view, <laughs> this, in combination with the demands of harsh environmental conditions, caused by caused the intense. I'm sorry. <clears throat> In King's view, this combination with the demands of harsh environmental conditions caused the intensification of left brain function, which are cause and effect oriented, and it cut off the unconscious as a source of knowledge. This would account for a materialist worldview, the emphasis on technology and an ability to get beyond linear concepts. This will also account for intensely destructive behaviors on a cultural level stemming from the need for control, power, and aggressiveness. For King, melanin and the pineal gland are the keys to a deeper spiritual consciousness on which level human beings can integrate their understanding slash knowledge to reach metaphysics, metaphysical truths that unlock the doors of the dark unconsciousness bringing with it an emotional and psychological sense of security, a oneness with self, and inner peace. Really important, an inner peace. So um, perhaps this can understand, can explain why a, a white person could go up and shoot up, a, shoot up a building, kill countless people, and then say, I don't know why I did it, you know, because they're not able to tap into their unconscious thoughts, and therefore they're not able to understand um, their unconscious behavior is they're able to act on them but not understand truly where it's coming from i believe i'm sure they know it's because they're white i'm sure it, like they have been able to pinpoint that yes all of us white people are, are weird to some capacity but they're not able to understand that due, from them being white they are unable to um perhaps experience um i don't know inner peace psychological security, um, perhaps even lack the ability to thrive 
for a world where justice is on planet Earth, ensuring that no one is being mistreated. So um, I, I'm grateful to have melanin, but um, it's um, right, it's like um, ramifications to white people. With white people are very very interesting, and I must uh, study this further. Um, oh five. What was the what page was that on that you just read? Uh, top of four seventy, or like about the third sentence from four seventy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Ask. Oh, okay. Yeah, I uh, really. <laughs> okay. I really liked when she said this would account for a materialist worldview, the emphasis on technology and an inability to get beyond lineal concepts i know we talk about that a lot but like i really really liked that part because i think that we like we live in this society that is so materialistic like deeper than i think we even think like i was listening to a podcast the other day and they were talking about how the idea that like a lot of people say like oh sex work is work is like inherently like white supremacist because in non-white cultures, the idea of like sex is not a tradable commodity, right? It's like a spiritual connection. And so I think that it's really interesting because it is really true that um, they turn everything into a ma like the material or like, that's the point that that's why they can like colonize and invade all these places and take their resources and also further like pillage the earth because they just see things as like resources and no resources. And I think that that's also why I felt like, that's why I, I was talking about Diop and like having a white partner because I think that that influenced his perception of like only seeing things in a materialist way and only seeing it as like resources slash lack of resources and not connecting it to like further, whether it be like psychosexual or um, like spiritual analysis. Yeah, for for me, King King's entire theory is just kind of a like expanding on Welsing's neurochemical basis for evil. I think that based based on what Swa said, you know, I think that when given King's theory, when you bring that into, into effect, it kind of explains that, you know, the lack of melanin therefore allows such evil acts to take place. It allows, it gives the platform for these things to happen. I think with the issue that it seems to be going on is that rather than blaming Europeans, not blaming them, because it's not their fault that they don't have, you know, melanin, but rather than you know actually coming to the conclusion that the lack of melanin that their lack of melanin is the driving motivation for their aggression against people with melanin and you know and chalking it up to like ash said to resources and you know a, a racial fantasies or or freud's theories blah blah the the um the statement needs to be made that these people are attacking, aggressing against the world's people because of their lack of melanin. That's something that I would like to, you know, get get more accustomed to saying. Um, you know. And also, Ash, you know, what you said was very against women's rights. <laughs> Wait, what do you mean? You know, sex work is work. <laughs> yeah uh, sorry that was yes so let's let's trade it on the marketplace you know <laughs> you know you're going to be able to invest in some 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 broccoli it was very soon there are going to be some apps you can invest in called hooker me you will be able to go 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 swipe and find a hooker or find a prostitute you want to have bring over to your your pad and um you know it's all it's all you realize that that is an actual thing right it's called ashley madison oh uh, well you know it's, it's all gonna be <laughs> more fine you know yeah it's an app to cheat on your wife with a paid prostitute oh uh, 
You know, the why the whites have this thing in the bag and this thing being um just violent behaviors, decrepit behaviors, animalistic behaviors, and just behaviors that I don't think the creator um, intended to be on this planet, but due to the, the creator being busy with other things, we must solve this problem <laughs> on our own. Um, and hopefully we could get a couple um, billion black people to help us because I think that's what we need. Um, but I think we can also get into closing comments. Uh, I'm really to think about that. Yeah, I just wanted to make one last comment about vitamin D, vitamin D. You know, you get that from the sun's rays. He brings it up once again. He says, it was in fact in this situation of when he's talking about um, being in colder climates, the sun's rays are needed for, photosynth for the photosynth photosynthesis of vitamin D, which allows the calcium in food to be used by the body. In low sunlight, highly melanated skin acted to prevent the body from converting vitamin D1 and vitamin D2 to its active form. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to, I wanted to bring that up because uh, it, it is commonly known that black, many, most, almost every black person is lacking vitamin D, which, you know, causes depression and other kinds of disorders. Um, so uh, basically, I just bring it up to say, let's get some more sunlight before we turn to Europeans. Yeah, I just read that too. You have to get more sunlight than like, they say you're supposed to get like, like the average person is based, supposed to get like 15 minutes, but that's based on like white people and the way that they um, trans, like they transfer sunlight into vitamin D. So you have to like get even more as a black person because you're, you're supposed to be out in the sun all the, most of the time. So that's like the norm. Yeah, I found that quite interesting actually. And I think that is very important to state too, especially going into, as we're talking about spirituality, it's important that we get energy from the sun, you know, we get some sunlight to power us. But I also think that um, as Kwaku mentioned, it helps with a lot of things such as like mental or um, emotional things. And oftentimes it could help with physical things. I'm not sure, like some people just be sweating in the sun. I just say you losing weight, you know, but um, <laughs> I think it's important that that's on the record that it's important for non-white people with melanated skin to get sunlight. Um, more than 15 minutes and make it intentional. I've tried to make it intentional. Um, Quaco and I try to get at least a few hours of, in the day of sunlight. So we essentially go outside and, and either stand out there, walk around, whatever it is. Um, I decided to work outside like on the garden area to like help with like getting sun. So it's just like th different things like that to help. And I also found like meditating in the sun is also so nice. Like, I don't know if it's because I'm outside or closer to the earth that it's just so nice to like meditate um, in the sun at the beach, whatever, in some natural form in a hike in nature. And it just it feels that you can possibly reach something higher if you are outside. Yeah, it, uh, it reminds me of the Welsing Institute. I think it was the one before last where the guy was saying, um, you know, that's where he said, you know, black people don't, are vitamin D deficient. And, you know, vitamin D is what actually caused, uh, you know, white, white pe uh, black people to become Caucasian or what caused, you know, Caucasians to turn white. Um, so, yeah, I forgot where I was going with that. That's a, so I bring bring it up once again, you know, get the vitamin D, um, therefore, so we don't turn into white people. Um, I, for one, like to go to the, like to get, get a little bucket of coconut oil, lather up and go sunbathe, make all the white people uncomfortable um, at the beach. I don't do it for them. I do it for me. But the uh from one thing that i commonly see at the at the beach though is uh black people hiding hiding away from the sun rays under their tents and whatnot and uh, under the guise of i don't want to get darker and while the uh white people are out there killing themselves trying to get 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 that vitamin d um so very important stuff it's, you know i think also I'm wanted to add to anyone who's like watching this cow's milk does, is not a source of calcium <laughs> it actually depletes the calcium from your bones so do not drink milk thinking you're getting calcium from it if 
for those of us who are watching this, if you haven't stopped drinking cow's milk yet, I don't know, I don't know what to tell you. you know? I mean, for various reasons, pe all non-white people should have stopped stopped drinking that a while ago. You know? I mean, I'm sure there's cultures around the world where they drink cow's milk. I don't, I don't even know if that's true. I don't even know if that's what they're supposed to be doing. But, you know, cut it out. Um, just to just to start off with, I'm not sure if anyone had anything else to say, but I can start off with closing comments. Okay, uh, just to start off with some closing comments. Um, one of the things I uh, would love to do, like especially once I log off of here a little bit later today, is like just to go through these theories again and have a moment to just like research each theory. I know I got to do that with. Um, with Diop, I got to go and look at articles just because I was very curious and just to see about the um, the theory the theory and death. But I think it'd be important for me to like continue on reading um, into those theories and just see how they're um, related, similar, not similar things I would relate with or not. Um, some of the things that I found that was quite interesting in here is how some would say like, "Hey, this is a uh, melanin problem." This is just a um, like an, a grow up problem. Like this is because the due to aggressiveness is due to the way Europeans grew up. Our aggressiveness is due to the lack of melanin. The aggressiveness is due to a lack of education. Whichever it is, um, or the aggressiveness is just like how they are wired. So it was very interesting to go through this and and read through all the theories and really apply it. And although I did know a little bit about Dr. Francis Quest Welsing's theory, I still got to read it from a different lens, you know, and, and Dr. Ani um, did a great job of summarizing that theory and, and kind of can, almost comparing it to the other ones. So I thought that was um, a great thing to do um, for this few pages. And yeah, I don't know if I should popcorn or Okay, I'm just gonna go ahead and popcorn to 0526. All right, closing comments. Um, really, really um, appreciate it. The wealth of knowledge that um, I got from um, King's Theory and I'm very happy to have been directed to um, this uh, man's uh, work because I, I felt he was also a young a person who attempted um, very much to solve this problem and has left us black people with um, a ton of resources to um, develop our black self-respect, our black spirituality, and um, to raise our black consciousness. So I'm gonna be researching more of his work, possibly buying a book or two of his. And um, oh, fascinating but tragic to um, learn about this. Um, rabbit hole of a reality that we are forced to live in due to racism white supremacy i'll send it over to ash um yeah i also would like to read um richard king's work i really liked this section it was like really comprehensive i think you could like literally have this section standalone and be able to like give it to people and like, I think really good conversations could come out of it about what their ideas are and theories are. And I think it's like incumbent on, on all of us to be able to like, at least explain them so that if people are asking, like we can kind of explain it in a way that is like accessible. Um, what else was I gonna say? Oh, fun fact, Bobby Wright was a mentor to Fred Hampton. So that's interesting. Um, that's all I had to say. Other than that, I'm excited for the next chapter. Thank you, Big Sis. Uh, for me. <laughs> Don't start calling me elder, man. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, for, for me, um, I wanted to close with this. Uh, it was on the topic of race relations. You know, I found, I found the paragraph. So I'll read this as, for my closing. Um, and uh, rather a new area of discourse is created called race, relation, race relations, which implies, first of all, that all races are equally involved in the problem of conflict. In addition, the concern is very pragmatic, 
quite materialistic, in fact. How can we minimize conflict in the workplace or other social situations by understanding our differences in attitudes towards one another? Differences apply to all of those groups that may be brought into contact with an urban situation, Africans, Asians, Latinos, Europeans, etc. In other words, even the reactions of non-Europeans to white racism become part of the problem with the eventual result taking the focus away from the real problem, the European. Um, so yeah, food for thought, uh, be wary, you know, you are not the problem and how you, your reaction to racism is not the problem. It is the Europeans, they are the problem. Mr. Ann, uh, Ms. Nebula, you guys like to do a closing comment? I can't really close out. Okay, so my closing comments is um, um, I've really enjoyed listening to this discussion. It's been highly constructive. Um, some amazing questions have been asked and um, it's, yeah, it's been very brain stimulating and I, and I hope that um, more solutions can be like fostered from the articulations that have um, happened here today because it was highly constructive for me. I'm even going to go back and listen to it again when I actually have read um, up to the the point. But I will be caught up by next week and give me two seconds to just get uh, make sure Mr. N is ready for him. Yeah, closing comments. You gotta keep Europeans under the watch for eye, protect your um, yourself at all costs. Um, the uh, acts against you in the system will always be negative when done by Europeans. So it's best to keep educating oneself on the behavior and treatment of others in the system. Um, it's my closing comments. All righty.